Hello everyone and welcome to the first video of Management Accounting, also known as MAF. As a first topic, we'll be talking about as a general introduction to Management Accounting. So what is Management Accounting? So generally when you go into the workplace, you may be in a financial accounting role. So a financial accounting role will be more to do with the preparation of financial statements, of uh, monthly P&Ls, balance sheets, cash flow statements, etc. Another potential career path is auditing, and a third is management accounting. So what management accounting is, is it complements the financial accountants, and they focus on cost accounting, budgeting, and controls. So cost accounting is having a look at the costs, and it might be looking at more of an analytical perspective, whereas financial reporting is just reporting the numbers and that's it. Another thing that management accountants do is they budget. So they look forward and, and expect what the numbers are going to be in next year, the year after and so forth that the financial reporting team are going to produce. Now the reason that that separation is there is because it uh, prevents any uh, kind of consolidation of uh, or cartel behavior where the financial reporting team may try and uh, pursue a certain agenda, etc. So by having that division of separation, uh, there is a little bit more transparency, a little bit more control in the processes. So management accounts are very much uh, aligned with the operations teams as opposed to finance uh, and the decision makers within the, within the organization. And the reason is it's very much about interpreting what the financial reporting team uh, looking at trends and, and how does that translate into actual decisions and again there's that separation between the financial reporting team and the management accounting team so in the CSG there's this table which kind of outlines some of the differences between what a management accountant is and what a financial accountant is so for example the purpose of the information in management accounting is to help managers make decisions whereas in financial accounting it's communicating that so really just putting the numbers together for them. Um, and the users for management accounting are managers and decision makers, whereas financial accountants, uh, the users are external users, such as investors, banks, who actually rely on that information. The focus and emphasis, so management accounting is looking forward, particularly for budgeting, etc. And financial accounting is more oriented towards the past. So, you know, they're usually looking at last financial years accounting accounts and they may not be ready for another six months or so until after the financial year's ended. Um, so time span of reports. So management accounts, they'll look forward up to almost 20 years in some instances, but generally it's a longer time into the future. Um, and whereas financial accounting is, is a fairly short period, so annual and half yearly reports. And behavioral implications, so management accounting helps influence the behavior and the decisions of managers and other employees, whereas financial accountants uh, tend to influence behavior um, primarily around remuneration and compensation because that's the result that we're reporting to you know, investors, etc. So management accounting uh, has, has five key steps according to the CSG. So number one is understanding the information requirements of key stakeholders. Number two is gathering the information that's required to produce that report. Uh, number three is analyzing and interpreting. So this is an important one just because it's not just putting out data, it's analyzing and interpreting it. Number four is drawing conclusions based on that analysis. And number five is presenting information and making recommendations to management. So again, it's really just taking the information that the financial reporting team has produced, uh, understanding what it really means, and then effectively communicating that back to management. So we then break up each of these five steps into a little bit more detail. So the first one's just understanding the business information requirements. So to be able to do that, you need to have a certain skill set which is slightly different to those in financial reporting. So you need to understand the organization, first of all. So what, what are the key drivers of the business? You know, is it revenue? Sorry, is it visits? Is it a average revenue per visit? You know, what's is it a labor driven or is it a you know, what, what are the key drivers of the business and what makes a business successful? Number two, you need good relationship with those decision makers and management. So if you're in financial reporting, um, it doesn't matter as much if you're a quiet 
you know, um, non-talkative, not good with people person because all you have to do is pull the numbers, check them, and consolidate them. Whereas for someone working in management accounting, you need to be able to influence decision makers. You need to be good at communicating it to them. Number three is an understanding of the different types of activities that management perform and the information required to support those activities. So obviously understanding those stakeholders, so not only just having that relationship, but really understanding who they are, what they do, why they would need what they do, and this all helps form part of that communication process. And the fourth part is knowing the right questions to ask in order to identify and clarify information needs. So it's not always clear um, to you know know what you need to be asking for or what you need to be doing. Um, if you're in financial reporting, it's the same thing. It's just doing the same financial report over and over. Whereas management and accounting, it's always a different problem, right? It could be it could be a trend in sales, like why is our business declining? There's so many different possibilities there. You need to really think out loud and say, okay, where should I be looking first to try and figure out that trend? So that's that's understanding business information requirements. The second step, which links up here. Uh, is the gathering of information, so actually getting that data together. So a few of the considerations, and it's you know it's not it's not that just simple as getting the report, um, you know, because you need to make sure that the data is correct. You need to make sure that the data we can actually obtain it. Um, you know, you've got to consider the systems and who knows how to use the systems and what export it can be, you know, retrieved in. Number two is, is the data reliable? This is a really important one because you can be given a set of numbers, but if you report numbers to management and it ends up being wrong, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So you really need to vet that information. You need to look through it. Uh, recently, there was an example of the Australian JobKeeper payment where the government put out an estimate that the scheme would cost something like $80 billion, and it ended up only costing about $40 billion because what they what happened in, in the data is there was an issue where businesses had imported, um, instead of the uh, number of employees, they had put in their wage or some other data point. And because people hadn't gone through and scrubbed that data, they were actually working off the wrong data set. And that's obviously gotten the the, the, um, the government and the analysts preparing it in a lot of trouble. So we've got to make sure that the data is reliable and correct. Number C, will it meet stakeholder requirements? So it's a common problem in terms of you send out an information crest, and the data you get back isn't what you asked for. So this is similar to that. The stakeholders may have a problem, and we may give them a solution, but the stakeholder reads this and says, this isn't, you know, this doesn't solve my problem. So we've got to make sure that that does that. And you know, you've got to consider how you're going to get the information as well, so from internal sources and external sources. So internal might be IT systems, sales data, financial reports, uh, business plans, etc. whereas external sources may be market and competitor analysis, you know, political analysis, and so forth. So step three is analyzing, interpreting information. Um, so this is, you know, probably one of the biggest points. So now you've got that information, you know what you have to do. How do we actually get that data out and actually extrapolate what it's telling us? So we might need to look at trends. We might need to look at benchmarking. We might need to look at volume, cost volume profit, cost benefit, customer profitability, economic value added, net present value. So these are all the different kinds of you know metrics and analysis tools that we could use. It depends on what we're trying to achieve. For example, net present value, that's generally a means of uh, valuing you know, what, what a business is worth. So if we're looking to acquire a business, that might be an appropriate tool, but a you know cost volume profit may not be appropriate in that situation. So it's really understanding what are the available options and which one you should choose. Step four is drawing a conclusion. So, you know, it's one thing to see a trend in the data, and it's another thing to actually conclude from that data what the answer is. You know, it, it really takes a, a, a very big and different and varied skill set to be able to pull all of these things together and come up with an answer that is actually correct. And finally, presenting information. So, there's a quote by someone that the quality of the analysis is only as good as you've communicated. If you haven't communicated it well, it's as if your analysis has never been done. Look, so let's say you've, you're the smartest guy in the world and you've done this amazing report. You've figured out what the problem is, you've got all the right data, you've analyzed it into a, you know, um, a trend, and you understand what the problem is. But if you can't tell the CEO and the people who are actually 
need to know so they can execute these decisions, what the problem is, what they have to do, and how you got there, well, then there's pretty much no point you have even done all, done all the points before that because the whole purpose is that we solve this problem and if he can't solve it and if you haven't communicated to him how we can solve it then it's the, we're in the same boat as if you hadn't done the analysis so the role that management accounting and treasury functions play within an organization so a key uh, division that management accountants often work in is called treasury now treasury is a key function within the organization that has two main functions so number one is advising management on the optimum cap capital structure based on the organization's objectives so this will be looking at you know what's our debt to equity ratio should we get more debt on our books should we issue a share raising so we have more equity um, as you would have known from your other subjects is there's a number of benefits and number of downsides to having debt and equity on the books um, as well as, you know, what's your working capital in the business? So working capital is, you know, how much funds you have in the business, you know, for short-term assets and short-term liabilities. So things like inventory, your cash, you know, making sure that we can meet our short-term obligations, but not having so much cash tied up in working capital that you could be getting better returns elsewhere. So these are the kinds of considerations 4.1 about optimal capital structure. And number two is managing the financial risks of the organization. So, you know, have we got enough cash to pay our bills? You know, are we insolvent? Can we pay all our long-term liabilities? Is, you know, <coughs> and so forth. So what are the objectives of Treasury? So there's a few key things that Treasury actually does um, on an everyday basis. So number one is Treasury management. So that's managing the flow of funds through the business. So that's to optimize profitability and increase the value of the organization within its risk appetite. Because you'd have some organizations with a low risk appetite and a high risk appetite. You might get higher growth with a higher risk appetite, but it also puts the business at risk. So it really depends on the organization. Which leads on to our second point, which is around managing the risk appetite. So understanding um, and, and maintaining the amount of risk an organization will accept in order to achieve the desired level of return. So you don't want to put your business in too much risk. For example, uh, you know you might put your funds in a very risky, um, you know, uh, investment vehicle, which offers high returns, but there's a high chance that it'll you know go bankrupt in a downturn. And then let's say COVID nineteen hits, and all of a sudden those investments are worthwhile. So worthless, sorry. So you know you've got a high return for your company, but if it wasn't within that risk appetite, then you're going to get your company in a lot of trouble. And the third and final point is efficient and effective treasury management. So just ensuring that all the cash surpluses are invested, you know, making sure that all the money is actually working because if your money's not invested, it means that you're not getting the interest or returns and it's getting eroded by CPI. So every day that you have cash um, sitting around doing nothing, that cash is going down in real value. We also have to make sure that cash shortages are funded, um, that the interest rate and currency risks are managed, um, and that appropriate liquidity is maintained as well so that we can actually pay our short-term liabilities um, that are popping up. So here are some of examples of those treasury functions so which fit into those objectives. So number one is acquiring optimum finance. So you know making sure that your the company's actually got debt facilities in place at attractive rates and you, you know you can fund all those expansions and whatever projects you need to do. Number one, uh, number two is managing interest risk rate, foreign exchange risk and commodity risk. So you might be trading in, you know, in Japan, and there might be a lot of fluctuations going on. So what hedging tools and other financial instruments have you put in place to make sure that the profitability of your business isn't negatively impacted? Number three is advising management on capital structure and managing the organization's liquid assets and working capital cash management. So again, you know, what, making sure that management are aware of the risks and benefits of each of the different capital structures, you know, so you might um, have a preference to have a certain level of debt in the business so you can take advantage of those interest deductions. Um, but making sure that management is aware of, you know, different priorities of debt and equity repayment and all those little different things which we'll go through later on in this um, topic. 
um, liaising with the organization's banks and credit agencies. So making sure you've got those uh, contacts, etc. So uh, you can always renegotiate um, uh, credit, etc. Number five is investor relations. So if this is particularly important if you're a listed entity on the you know stock exchange. So investor relations is a key part of the job because there'll, there'll be a number of questions coming back from investors. You've got to make sure that all management reports go out to them, financial reports go out to them. Um, dividend policy and disbursement. So ensuring that all dividends are regularly calculated uh, and funds are actually paid out to shareholders as well, as well as all communications to them so they understand what's going on so you don't have angry shareholders coming to you later on. So share repurchases as well. So often in an organization you'll have shares going in and out. Even if you're a private organization, you may want to buy back some of your minority shareholders uh, and that will involve calculating the value, communicating with shareholders, ensuring the funds go in and out to arrange for those uh, changes in capital structure. And then finally, mergers and acquisition analysis. So you might have you know, a transaction where you're buying another business or a competitor and so forth. So you'll need a team to actually manage that process from the communication to the due diligence, you know, to the legals and so forth. So within the uh, treasury function, there's usually two types of structures. So number one is the cost structure and number two is the profits uh, center. So an organization will generally either structure the treasury function as one or the other, not both. And basically what that means is is whether the division is seen as a cost or whether it's actually going to make profit for the business and how it will make profit is actually recharging across to a different business unit so let's start off with that profit center first so let's say you know the division has a uh, maintenance cost of 10 million dollars every year and that's the division's labor it's the division's uh, you know outsourced costs and a fixed cost like rent and utilities and so forth. So it's $10 million a year just so the business can maintain this function. So what that business can do is actually issue an invoice to the corporate, uh, to the support office and say, here's our cost. And you can even add a little bit on top. So maybe plus 3%, which is our management fee. So that means the business is charging out 10 million plus 3%. So its net profit will be zero plus whatever the difference of the management fee was, so the 3% on 10 million. So their net profit is actually going to be positive and therefore there'd be a profit center. Now the opposite is if they didn't invoice out their cost, they'd be a cost structure, which is basically, it's a cost unit, so it just accumulates costs within the business period um, and it'll be a negative uh, profit business unit of $10 million. So there's a few different advantages and disadvantages of each. So number one is the business units can charge market rates. Um, and you know, this might be important if they're offering it for you know, internal and external people, so for the organization and maybe some external clients. So I knew a uh, division of which offered recruitment both to the company that owned it, but it also had an external function which made a little bit more money on the side. And by offering those market rates, it helped contribute to some actual operating profit and it made it more realistic as well. Number two is a department could actually be more motivated to make a profit um, by managing that P&L regularly, and this could help contribute to the bottom line, which would benefit the organization. So number, so the disadvantages of structuring it as a profit center is by measuring performance on profit, there's a temptation to speculate, which could risk exposure within the business. So for example, um, you know, the to manage the business's credit uh, or FX risks, or interest risk, they might invest in a, a riskier um, financial product, which might have a higher chance of going bankrupt, and therefore they're unnecessarily increasing the risk exposure of the company that owns this profit center. Um, number two is considerable management time may be spent adjudicating between treasury and business units in regard to chargeouts. Um, you know, it's just it's really just an internal thing. It doesn't add a lot of value. And if there's a dispute between the business units, then it could waste time in disputes. And potentially there's additional administrative costs from doing all, all that extra work. So there's a few different roles that the management accounting 
um, and treasury functions play within an organization. There's four types. There's outsourced, centralized, decentralized, and a combination of the two. So number one is outsourced. So some organizations just may, just hire an external firm to actually manage their treasury function. Um, and, and the most common reason for that is it's the, the task involved in managing a treasury is becoming increasingly complex. And not everyone in an organization, especially smaller organizations, have that skill set to be able to manage that. Um, and not everyone's able to monitor financial markets 24 hours a day. Whereas if you have a big outsourced treasury firm, they will have the resources and specialization to be able to do these kinds of things. So there's some benefits to centralized. So centralized is basically where it's part of the head office control. The next step uh, under this process is determining the stakeholders. You know, understanding what their different objective is, what the information needs, and how we can best satisfy them. So the definition of a stakeholder it can be an individual person, or it could be a group, or it could be an organization itself. Um, and these are the people who have a stake in the outcome of a decision um, because they can be affected by them. For example, shareholders will be affected by you know the profitability of the business. You know, government could be impacted by the environmental decisions of the company. It could be the suppliers and staff, um, creditors. It could be the internal personnel as well. So the managers, the CEO, the CFO. You know, if they decide to outsource the finance division, obviously the CFO is going to be impacted by that. So, a lot of different examples of that. Uh, and then, of course, we need to consider what's the most effective means of communicating with stakeholders. So that might be with financial reports, written reports, balance scorecard reports. So that'll be like a traffic light system of red equals bad, yellow equals okay, slash could be better, and, and green is great. Um, and review of management reports as well. So the difference between management reports and financial reports is financial reports generally have to comply um, with accounting standards when they're presented, whereas management reports, they're tailored. They can be presented in any way you want because it's a custom report for management. So you don't need to follow accounting standards. So for example, you might only track one specific type of revenue and you can do that on a cash or accruals basis because there's no rules around how you want to do it. It's just what you want in that report. Um, and then determining the stakeholders continued on. So this is the some examples of information required by different stakeholders, which is outlined in your CSG. So it might be strategic information, so to do with strategy. So an example of a key stakeholder who would need strategic information is the board of directors. So that level of detail. So strategic is generally very high level, um, and it's generally historic or, or could be predictive. Um, so it's it's information that helps inform the decision on 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 making those really high level decisions like for example do we want to continue acquiring businesses do we want to you know develop our own business internally should we go into a certain market so that that strategy that very high level direction now there's operational information which is a level down for example a product manager with responsibility for product sales volume so it's a, it's a lot more detailed in nature so for example, you might want to give a product manager, you know, all the different types of products within his division, um, how that's been trading over a long historical period um, at a very detailed level. Now you wouldn't give that to the board of directors because it's, it's just too much information for them. They want to focus on high level, whereas operations need to focus on detailed information because that actually helps them drive their specific role, uh, which is generally more specialized than someone on the board of directors. Um, and then monitoring and measuring performance is another one. So for example, a cost manager with responsibility for managing staff. So he knows he needs to know how he's tracking. Um, so what's his KPI? So whether that's the budget or against prior year. So he needs to know that information. Um, and it's also important to be able to monitor changes. So let's say we implement a new system. Um, it's important that we send management reports to the people, to the key stakeholders and saying, this is how we tracked before the change. This is how we tracked after the change. So this is often a key step that's neglected. We do a lot of analysis before implementing a change, but it's often forgotten to do the analysis after the change is implemented and actually see how that you know, is tracking and whether that was the right decision. And there's routine reporting. So it might be like a monthly p &L, It could be a weekly cash flow forecast to make sure we've got enough liquidity. Or it could be ad hoc. So ad hoc just basically means any general reporting you know, your manager might come to you and say, hey, I need this analysis on a specific 
report or it might be looking at you know just a one-off unusual thing um, that would fall under ad hoc reporting <clears throat> so general strategies that organizations use is the third category um, so strategy so strategy is an attempt to determine a long-term plan for success we talked a little bit about it before so it's very high level for example do we want to go into a particular new market or a new product line um, so Porta which is a it's a uh, empirical work and when I say empirical work this is basically just a paper that's been put forward in this field of business um, it, dated 1996 he makes the claim that organizations mistake simple operational effectiveness for strategy i.e. doing the same things as competitors only better so what that means is so strategy is thinking big picture, right? So it's, you know, do we want to go into a new product line, new market, etc.? Are we doing the right thing? Whereas operational effectiveness is, let's do what we're currently doing, but let's do it as good as we can possibly do. Well, that's, that's usually a good thing, but what happens if strategically you are doing the wrong thing? For example, you are operating in a market that might not, look, might not exist in three years, and you're putting all this work in to be the best damn operator in that market, but it doesn't really matter if the market's not going to exist. So that's basically what he's talking about there. And strategic planning is, you know, it's it's establishing the things that you need to do or seeking a difference that can be preserved in order to ensure superior profitability and therefore long-term survival. So I use the example of, you know, is that market even going to be around in, in, in some time? Well, yes, you know, this is the key part here, long-term survival. So we might be we might have superior profitability through this operational effectiveness, but if the market doesn't exist, then there's no long-term survival. So he also put forward this generic business problem-solving approach. Um, so number one is to find the destination. So where do we want to go? What's our strategic direction? So we want to, you know, by 2025, we want to have, you know, one product line in each market. We want to have a 20% market penetration. We might want to, you know, so forth. Step two is environmental analysis. So you're looking at the internal and external environments. So external might be, you know, government policy. Um, internal environment might be, you know, the, the staff that we have on board, the investment capability, our financing, etc. Generate alternatives, strategic alternatives. So, you know, maybe instead of investing in this, you know, small market over here, what we could do is... Um, you know, we could double down on our other market, which is our cash cow, and, and, and really just cash cow and really just drive that market instead. And the fourth one is select the best, implement and monitor. So consider all your strategies, including the alternatives that you've put forward. Consider the resources that you have and consider how those are allocated and then evaluate and then control it and provide feedback. So for, I gave the example about should we double down in our actual cash cow market, which is sustainable, rather than spending all this money on a new product or a new market which isn't going to exist. Let's get rid of that allocation, reallocate it to our profitable market. And then we just evaluate it, make sure that we track it over time and see if our projections around the old market and the new market actually were consistent. Make sure we made our decision off the right data. Okay, so this is just going through each of those steps above in a little bit more detail. I don't think we particularly need to do it. Um, I'll just go through some of the key parts. So vision is the direction of the organization. Um, so strategic analysis, so looking at our environment. So a common way of doing that, which is just this part up here, a common way of identifying those two, internal and external you know, pros and cons, is using a SWOT analysis. So many of you are probably familiar with this already. So this is basically a two by two square, so four squares in total. Um, and each of the letters in SWOT stands for something. So it's strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So strengths and weaknesses are basically, you know, your internal, external factors which are currently affecting your business. So where are you good at? Where are you weak at? Which of these are internal? Which of these are external? And then opportunities are threats. So opportunities are like, you know, what can we do next that we haven't already done? And threats are what are possible risks that aren't current but may arise in the future. Um, and then... Continuing on this step two, so another means of identifying this internal and external environment, we could do an internal analysis, so looking at the factors within the organization, for example, the structure, the culture, and the resources. 
Um, and there's some frameworks that we can view this through. So number one is value chains, and number two is a resource-based view. So a value chain, what's a value chain? So again, this was proposed by the same guy, Porter, this concept. So in order to determine the strengths and areas of competitive advantage, an organization should analyze its generic value chain. So a supply chain is the steps from raw materials to finished goods. And a value chain separates steps into categories aligned with responsibilities, allowing an organization to assess the value out of each activity from the customer's perspective. For example, you know, you might have a shipping part. Let's consider uh, Woolworths, for example. So they'd have, you know, suppliers is, is where it starts off. So the farms out in the countryside. And then you might have a middleman who buys up all the products from the farmers and sells that to Woolworths. And then you might have a distribution center which buys all the products and then sends it out to each of the Woolworths stores. And then you might have a trucking company which manages all the, the fleet of trucks which deliver to your stores. And then you've got your branch of stores and, and, a, and a whole network of managing those. And then you've got your customer experience in there as well. So you've got you know, self-service checkouts, you've got you know, man's checkouts um, and so forth. So it's looking at each of those parts and saying, Okay, so where is the value add for each of these? You know, we currently ex we export, um, sorry, we outsource our you know mi our uh, trucking management facility. Maybe we could bring that in house, and that was that's going to reduce our cost, which we can pass on to the consumer. You know, maybe it's we cut out the middleman and we actually start up um, buying all the farm products wholesale ourselves, and that's going to save us X amount of dollars. So it's really analyzing the total chain from start to finish of the business into different categories and, and seeing the cost and benefit of each and where's the opportunity lying. This is a great way of, of looking at your business internally. Um, and we generally split up this value chain concept put forward by Porter into two categories. So number one is primary and number two is secondary. So primary tasks, these ones at the tops are the key ones. They're the key um, function of the business. Um, and they, these primary tasks are supported by secondary tasks. So consider it like primary is like the key operations of the business and the secondary task is like the head office usually. So you might have a you know, payroll function or an HR management in your support office because to be able to do all these key steps, you need to have staff. And then to manage those staff, you need an HR department and so forth. So that's how we split it up to look at it as well. So key, key functions and then secondary functions. And then further, so still on the same step, still on internal and external analysis, we, we also use this resource-based view. So this concept was put, bought, put forward empirically by a different author, this time Barney, 1991. And he believed that an organization is required to look internally at its own resources and compare these to its competitors' resources to see if it has, uh, to see if it can provide a competitive advantage. So this has two steps. So number one is identify the resources, um, and he put forward three categories where you could allocate those to. And number two is to apply a series of tests to each resource to see whether or not it can form the basis of a competitive advantage. And you know the kind of, the kind of characteristics that we're looking for in this test are which of these resources are valuable, which of them are rare, difficult to copy, not easily substituted. So the three categories that he put forward as part of this resource-based view is number one, tangible resources, number two, intangible resources, and number three, organizational capability. So tangible resources are physical objects. So for example, um, Apple has a lot of cash sitting around. It's got one, I think it was $1 trillion worth of cash sitting around, um, or just some huge amount of money. So, And same with Warren Buffett as well. So these firms are in a position to acquire, you know, a new company, whether it's part of the value chain, whether it's a competitor, whether it's investing in a new plant, and so forth. So that's that's a competitive advantage that Apple has. Um, and there's intangible resources, so non-physical assets. So that mostly this is IP, so intellectual property, so brand image. Um, it could be the employees itself, so it might have a really capable CEO or, or executive team, which are much better than a competitor. and, and you know, they're going to lead our company to a better position. And then there's organizational capabilities. So processes that turn inputs into outputs in a superior way, 
For example, extremely fast product development, super efficient manufacturing, outstanding customer service. So you might look at Toyota versus Nissan. And Toyota, we all know, has this just-in-time methodology where they get their inventory in really quick. They've got amazing processes. They value quality over anything else. Um, so you might argue that because of those processes that Toyota has a competitive advantage uh, versus Nissan, which doesn't have those processes in place. So in 20 years' time, there's a higher chance that Toyota will be around, whereas Nissan will not be. Okay, so now... Okay, so still on step two, but instead of internal, let's look at external analysis. So the external environment are variables outside the organization, so it's usually not within control of senior management. So they can be broad forces and trends with the general economy, or they can be specifically within the, you know, uh, the industry that that organization operates. So there are a few different frameworks that we can use to analyze the external economy. So the number one the first one we're going to go through is the Pestel analysis. Secondly, we're going to look at the Porter's Five Forces. Thirdly, we're going to look at the Competitor analysis. And number four, we're going to look at the Risk analysis. So the first uh, framework of analyzing the external uh, drivers is the Pestel analysis. So it's called the Pestel analysis because each of these letters stands for a certain category. So political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal. So the purpose of this is to identify issues within these categories that could have an impact on the products it produces or intends to produce. So managers need to think about which of these factors are likely to change and which ones will have the greatest impact on the business. We also need to identify key factors in the general business environment and its own environment. So political, we're looking at uh, trade regulations, taxation policy, and political stability. So we might be looking at uh, you know, grain farmers and thinking about uh, what are the implications if China, our biggest customer, puts on tariffs, as they have recently done in response to Australian government looking into the COVID origins. Um, you might have economic things. So what's likely to happen with interest rates? Are they likely to go up, which will have a big impact? Um, do we have exchange rates? Fluctuations, should we be looking at hedging? Um, you know, is our product demand linked to GDP and therefore we're exposed if our economy tanks? Um, they're social, so population demographics. For example, we might be operating in Japan, which is an aging workforce, but we're targeting, you know, a younger demographic, so maybe that's the wrong geographic to be focusing our attention on. It could be technological, so innovation, new product development, and rate of technological obsolescence. So maybe our machinery, which is our current technical, uh, current competitive advantage over competitors, maybe it's aging rapidly and without current, without R and D and investment in those um, technology, uh, we might fall behind against our competitors. It might be environmental, so it could be global warming, environmental issues. Um, it could be legal, so competition law, health and safety, employment law, and product regulations. So maybe you're working in childcare, which is a heavily regulated industry. Um, and we should be constantly aware or even lobbying the government on certain you know, issues around regulation of childcare centres, which may improve our profitability. So the second uh, framework that we're going to look at in terms of understanding external issues is the Porter's Five Forces. So what this framework does is it looks at the forces most relevant in determining strategic behaviour. So it, some of the key things it does is evaluate competitors, customers, suppliers, and labor supply within the industry in which the organization works. So these are the five forces here. And we'll go into detail about each of what each of these mean. So bargaining power of suppliers. So this is, you know, for Woolworth, it could be the farmers who provide those goods. We've got the threat of new entrants. So, for example, you know, it might be Aldi coming in or a new German supermarket coming into market. So how easy it is for them to come in and enter and disrupt your oligopoly or monopoly on the market. We've got the bargaining power of buyers. So, for example, your customers who come into your shops or perhaps from the farmer's perspective, it's, you know, it's Woolworths and they've got a lot of bargaining power right now because there's only so few competitors in that market. It could be the threat of substitute products or services. So you might be um, Intel, for example, and you're creating, 
you know, you've got a, a high market capture of graphics cards, but then someone like AMD comes along and they've got, you know, a similar product, which is cheaper and does the same job or even better. Um, and a lot of market share is quickly being eroded because of that. And then you've got rivalry. The fifth one, the middle one is rivalry among existing organizations, so industry competitors. So you might have Coles lowering its prices relative to Woolworths, which might chip away at Woolworths market concentration and so forth. So let's go into a little bit more detail into each of these. So first of all, the top one, the suppliers, bargaining power suppliers. So some of the the um, sources of power for suppliers are switching costs. So for example, um, if Woolworths were to switch to a different supplier, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money to set up those new relationships, those new systems, those, you know, upfront fees, any rebates to renegotiate. So there is some cost. Differentiation of inputs, so different inputs. Supplier concentration. Um, so they might make up a large percentage of that market. Um, presence of a substitute. Import, importance of volume to supplier. Impact of inputs on cost or differentiation. Threat of forward slash backward integration, cost of relative total purchase and industry relative size. So I, I probably won't list all of these points. I think I'll just explain what each of them are in general. So threat of new entrants. Um, so, you know, I gave the example of Woolworths. What's the risk of a new German supermarket competitor? You know, as was the case when Aldi came into Australia a few years ago. And then there was another competitor trying to come in and Costco came in as well. Um, so it's really, you know, economies of scale. How big is Australia? You know, is it worth it for those competitors? Um, how important is brand in the equation? How much capital is actually required? Because you might have equipment that costs billions and billions of dollars. It's actually going to create a, quite a large barrier to entry. But if you're just setting up a few shops, it's probably not a large barrier to entry. Um, you know, product differences. So, you you know, you've got those Aldi products that Aldi sells versus the, the product brands that, you know, coal sells. So what's different there? Again, switching costs. Um, you know, how long is it going to take to learn the market to come in and and, 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 and have that new learning curve? Um, access to inputs, low cost product design, government policy and restrictions, and expected retaliation. So you might actually have, you know, Woolworths turning into a, a cost cutting um, business. Um, or might even sell their products to become a loss leader. So losing money on all the products they sell just for long enough to make the competitor go bankrupt. And then after that, they can increase their prices. These are all, so these are all facts to consider is how high is the threat and the barrier of entry for new entrants. So rivalry, the middle one between existing um, organizations. So how, how um, fast is the industry growing? You know, what's the concentration look like? You know, if, if Coles has 90% of the market and Woolworths has 10%, um, then obviously Coles, it, it's possible for them to push out Woolworths by, you know, offering lower prices and so forth. Um, you know, differences in product, brand identity, the switching cost for the consumer, um, informational complexity, diversity of competitors, so actually how different they are. So Coles and Woolworths, I think, are pretty similar. So customers could easily switch between the two just based on, say, price, for example. Um, exit barriers, discounting. And then what else have we got? So we've got bargaining power of buyers. So buyers can actually, you know, band together and negotiate lower prices. Um, so, you know, how concentrated is that buyer market? Um, you know, how large is the volume as well? Because if it's a small market, then... They probably don't have a lot of buying power. Switching costs is the same for all of these. Buyer profits, um, price sensitivity, and so forth. And then finally, threat of substitute products or services. So um, that's the risk that uh, I gave the the, uh, the example of AMD and Intel. So AMD's come along with a you know product which does the same job, if not better, for a lot cheaper, and buyers are switching to it for it as a result. And then, of course, there's a SWOT analysis, which we talked about. So just to summarize all of the frameworks that we have available, so categorizing between internal and external analysis. So SWOT covers both of them. SWOT's got internal and it's got external. For internal, we've just got the value chains and the uh, the resource-based view. And for external analysis, we've got the Pestel, Porter's Fire Forces, Competitor Analysis, and Risk Analysis. 
and they, each of these just feed into the SWOT analysis, so the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So actually listing each of them out one by one and seeing where most of it lies. So going back to step three, so after we understand our internal and external environment, we need to generate strategic alternatives according to Porter. So the strategy formulation definition is the development of long-term plans for the effective management of environmental opportunities and threats in lights of corporate strengths and weaknesses. So basically just matching up all the strengths and weaknesses that you identified previously and figuring out what's the best plan um, to achieve a sustainable, sustainable competitive advantage uh, over our competitors, which means it'll be difficult for our competitors to basically copy our approach. And then the fourth step is just to select and implement the best of those strategies. Um, so there's generally three types of strategy. There's corporate strategy, business strategy, functional strategy. So corporate strategy is deals with the industry or markets an organization seeks to compete in. So what you know, sh which 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 market should we go into? Which market should we leave? Um, business strategy. So that's um, how an organization competes in a single market or industry. Um, so it's relevant for a single business unit or product competing in a single industry. So you know, how's our approach of getting it out there? What's our approach of you know? distributing and so forth and then functional strategy deals with specific management functions so you might be looking at you know one division in your organization should we outsource our accounting team should we uh, invest in our production team should we you know cut our marketing team and and specifically around allocation of resources within those departments um, there's also a corporate level strategy so these are just generic options for growth um, so it could just be, you know, do we grow via acquisition or do we grow organically? Uh, it could be diversification. So, you know, should we go into a different product or market, merge acquisitions? So acquisitions are basically when you, you know, acquire another business and merger is when you basically two similar sized organizations, you kind of merge them together and you operate as one combined entity um, rather than the, you know, subsidiary just tucking in. Um, there's a vertical integration, so you might want to, you know, acquire a supplier. So, for example, Tesla is investing very heavily in battery technology because they know that they're going to get a competitive advantage. So, what they did is, is very early on, they bought up all the, the, you know, the best battery suppliers. And there's actually quite a large shortage of battery supply in the world, especially considering how much you're going to need to supply a mass market of electric cars. And the large manufacturers now, such as Daimler and BMW, etc., who are now getting on the trend of electric cars, are realizing that they actually don't have access to a lot of battery producers uh, and the latest technology as well. And Tesla, they've actually now got a, they've got a, a basically a monopoly on the battery market. They've got the best tech. They've got majority of the suppliers signed up exclusively, uh, and they've, and now they're starting to invest in their own battery factories as well. So you know. This vertical integration is a great example of what Tesla has done, and it's been a really, really helpful and a great strategy um, to you know diversify from their competitors. Okay, and then going to step four. So, which strategy do we actually choose? How do we actually allocate resources? How do we evaluate that and you know give feedback on the best strategy? Okay. So, we should be considering each of the three strategies that we discussed above, so corporate, business, and financial strategy. So let's focus on corporate strategy first of all. So this is a focus on attempts by corporate level managers and directors to raise the performance of business units within the organization. So it decides you know, which business units are in the portfolio at any point in time and how the parent contributes to the sustainable improvement of the operating performance of those business units. Now there's a few ways we can do that, so generic options for growth through acquisition and so forth. Um, next, so this is just a recap. And then the next strategy is business level strategy, which is this one here. So which is focusing on you know how an organization competes in a particular market. So So one of the key things is we need to focus on what's the core competency, what does that organization do well, um, and how, where does that strategic value lie, and how can we use that competitive advantage sustainably 
uh, and use those core competencies to achieve that. So one of the um, framework that we can use to review business level strategy is again from Porter, which is Porter's generic strategies. And he hypothesized that in order to create competitive advantage in a particular industry, an organization needs to adopt one of three generic strategies. So number one is cost leadership. Number two is differentiation. And number three is focus or niche. So cost leadership is basically, you know, having the most attractive price in a market. Number two is having a very different product. And number three is having a focus or a niche market. So let's think of some examples for each of these. So for cost leadership, let's use the example of Costco because Costco wants to differentiate from its competitors by being the cheapest in all of its products. Uh, so it's gonna allow you to buy in bulk to achieve that and it's gonna have uh, you know, large wholesale deals to get the cheapest product out. And that's why people go to Costco is to save as much money as possible. So number two, an example of differentiation could be Apple. So, you know, back in the day, Microsoft and IBM had a monopoly on the personal computer market. When Apple came along, they were selling a personal computer. It was still a PC at the end of the day. But what they were selling was something completely different. You know, it had amazing design. Um, all the marketing was on point. They had their own operating system, which was completely different to Microsoft. And it was all designed in their own way. And, you know, they had their own systems for everything. And people bought them because they were buying an Apple, not because they were buying a personal computer. You know, if they wanted a PC, then they might just want the cheapest one from Microsoft or IBM. But if you're buying an Apple, you don't really care about the price because you just want to buy an Apple because it's different. And it looks good. And the third and final one is a focus or niche. So you could, this could be, this is basically a small area in the market which is not being filled so you don't have to compete on cost and you don't have to compete on differentiation um, so examples of a niche market that you might enter into is for example you know um, making your products vegan uh, or dairy free to cater to a particular uh, part of the market um, you know which which want you know cruelty free products and so forth. There's numerous examples that you could extract for this, but it's generally a small market which isn't uh, heavily saturated, but generally has a lower you know, market concentration. Mm -hmm. So to summarize those three broad categories into five specific strategies which fit in within those um, broader strategies. So number one is broad, low-cost provider. So this is someone who you know, sell us to as many people as possible, but at a very low cost. So for example, Costco. There's broad differentiation provider. So this is offering point of difference around products or service that appeals to a broad spectrum. So for example, Apple would fit into this category. There's best cost provider. So this is providing excellent value to customers by offering high quality goods or services at a lower cost profile than its rivals. So it's very important that you understand the difference between this one here and this one here. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you're offering the cheapest products, okay? Because there could be, you know, a cheaper Chinese-made product, but it only lasts a year. So you could be making a product which is, you know, reasonably cheap. So maybe it's mid-range, but it's going to last you 10 years. So overall, your value proposition per year is still better than your other competitor, you know? So it could be something like a Seiko watch. So there's something cheaper than Seiko, but Seiko is good quality. It's going to last a while, a long time. You know, it's not, it's still pretty cheap, but it's not like the cheapest thing on the market. So, but I think it's got one of the best value propositions on the market for watches. You could be a focus strategy brand on low cost. So this is still around cost. So trying to achieve a lower cost profile than rivals. Um, but it's focused on delivery to a small band of customers. So it's a smaller market and lower cost. So it's not trying to get as many uh, people as possible. It's an, almost a niche market, but trying to get a low cost. And then there's focus strategy based on differentiation. So again, a small niche market, but a point of difference. So for example, there's a new market for lab-grown meat. 
um, and there's a few different providers working on it. There's one called Beyond Meat and there's a few other low cost providers. So the ones that are cheapest would be the focus strategy based on low cost and the one that's trying to provide maybe the best product or the, you know, the one closest to meat um, to real meat would be, you know, based on differentiation, focus strategy based on differentiation. So these can be summarized in this diagram below. Um, so it's a it's a two by two um, uh, square, and the x-axis is the type of competitive advantage being pursued. So it can either be lower cost and differentiation, and then on market size, it's either a narrow market market or a broader one. So this one up here would be a broad market, low cost. This one down here would be a narrow market focused on differentiation. And then ultimately the one in the middle is just pro possibly the best target, which is just best value proposition, um, regardless of being lowest price or anything. It's just what's the best value proposition to the customer. So to summarize you know, these types into a table, um, a, a worded table. So focusing on costs, so getting the cheapest one. So for example, um, these two strategies here, overall low cost and focus low cost. You know, the way you can achieve that is through high asset utilization rates. So fixing spread costs, sorry, spreading fixed costs over more activity. So, you know, economies of scale, the more you produce, the less it'll cost per item. Um, for example, Costco, you know, ordering as much as possible. You know, standardizing products, so using the same components in multiple products. Um, that That's what's happening with car companies these days is they're trying to just share parts between um, as many companies as possible, which brings down the cost. So automating it, so using robots instead of labor. Um, efficient supply chain, so buying in bulk, negotiating prices, controlling overhead costs. So basically just getting your own costs down. And then differentiation, which is you know these two strategies here, um, it's you know de delivering a high quality product or service. You know really strong sales and marketing. So this is what Apple is really good at when they in their differentiation, research, develop, and innovation. So you might have you know a new product on the market because you've you know put money in R and D. And it's most successful when customers are not price sensitive, i.e. you know because you generally pay a little bit more for a differentiation strategy than a low cost. So it should be, you, sh you should focus on a market where customers are not price sensitive. Um, most successful when it's not a highly competitive or saturated market, when there's no underservice of customer segments and organization with unique resources, talents, or knowledge. So for example, Apple had Steve Jobs. And then the focus strategy, which relates to these two at the bottom, which is you know finding a market niche instead of being a broad market provider, so as many customers as possible. It's focusing on a smaller market and targeting them. So it's a way of gaining competitive advantage by you know really customizing its product to meet the specific needs of a small target market. So if you're trying to sell to everyone, you know everyone's got slightly different needs and stuff like that. So it's if you do want to sell to everyone, your products are going to be relatively generic. And they might not solve all of the customer's, you know, problems or needs or wants. So this is the benefit of, you know, focusing on a certain market, is you can increase demand by really targeting and tailoring your product to meet that demand. So some of the elements to consider uh, is the size of it. It must be big enough to actually make enough revenue for the company. It can't be, you know, a market size of like three people. You know, must must have a decent size to, for us to make some profit. And is the organization actually capable of providing the specialized products? Because um, it's going to take some time. So since just some general points to get um, of learning to get to that optimal point, which is in between all of them, which is that best cost provider strategy, you know, best value proposition, basically. Um, number one, you should really only pursue one strategy. So don't try and pursue all four. Just choose one of them because you start getting confused. Um, and it's going to create problems. So you, you put yourself at risk of being caught between competing strategies and not achieving any of them. Um, but you can, however, create different business, business units or brands that pursue different strategies. For example, you know, Toyota is trying to have that mass market low cost, whereas Lexus is more of a smaller market, the luxury market, but differentiating. Um, so making you know, super high quality premium cars that are reliable.
So another point raised by Porter empirically is understanding strategies in the context of your industry's life cycle. So each industry is not static. Think of it as living in an ecosystem. And strategies that might work today might not work in future. So strategies need to be constantly monitored and changed as market conditions changes. So industries are in different life cycles, right? It could be a new industry, or it could have been existing for you know hundreds of years, and it's you know it's really a stable, very predictable, you know, not a lot of growth left in it. So these have just been empirically defined as either in the introduction phase of a life cycle, growth, maturity, or decline. The introduction is obviously the newest one. So, for example, a high-tech industry that's just come out. Um, and decline is something that's been around for a very long time and is slowly evaporating. So, for example, the mail service, um, you know, Nokia was another example as a company rather than the industry itself. So each of these can be defined by several KPIs. So appropriate generic strategy. So, you know, you shouldn't be trying to achieve a, a low cost strategy in a new market what you should be doing is trying to differentiate and have the best product whereas for a declining market you know cost leadership is probably the best one market growth is low for introduction very high for growth low to moderate for maturity and negative for decline number of segments very few some many few intensity of competition is low in the introduction because you know a lot of a lot of new companies haven't really entered the market yet Growth, it's increasing as people start pouring in. Maturity is very intense because it's been around for a long time. Decline is changing because some of those competitors might go bankrupt and leave the market. Emphasis on product design is very high in the introduction phase and it slowly phases, phases down to low in the declining phase. Emphasis on process design, which is intricately linked um, with you know trying to bring down costs and so forth. It's low in introduction getting all the way up to high in maturity and then low in decline. The reason it's low in decline is, you know, same reason that a lot of you know, manufacturers might be going out of business is that we don't want to invest too much strategically in, uh, in, a, in refining our processes in industry that might not be around very long. So in a mature industry, it makes sense because we expect it to be around a long time, but if it's in decline, well, probably time to look at the next industry and reallocate our resources into planning our next move. Major or function area of concern um, should be R&D for introduction, sales and marketing for growth, production for maturity, and then general management and finance for decline. And then overall objective for introduction is to raise market awareness, create consumer demand and growth, defend market share and maturity, and then consolidate, maintain, harvest or exit in decline. Okay, now we're gonna revisit this. So back to the types of strategy. Um, in terms of selecting and implementing the best strategic alternative. So we're going to focus on functional strategies now. So this is to do with specific management functions, for example, production, marketing, or accounting. So these are business unit strategies. It's dictated by the parent's corporate strategy. To be successful, it should be built around distinctive competency better within the functional area. So the financial performance of a business unit is determined by the joint impact of several effects. So the corporate effect, so parenting, head parent company advantages, business unit effect, you know, how good's the local management, the industry effect, so result of the life cycle of the industry, the year effect, so the macroeconomic cycles, the industry effect. So some industries have, you know, upturns and downturns in specific years, and then other. Okay, so now we're on to the last part of this chapter, which is just around reviewing, controlling, and providing feedback um, to strategies that have been implemented. And the reason is we need to you know, actually track whether it was the right decision and whether the data and forecasts we were working off were correct as well. So control is a step which, you know, step, which step managers must make to ensure that organizational strategies are implemented or modified. So the monitoring or effectiveness of actions and plans and taking remedial actions to correct deficiencies. So it's a major part of the control function. Um, without adequate control systems, employees may not act appropriately or in the organization's interests. Um, 
So control is the policies, procedures, measures, and systems that an organization uses to prescribe and measure performance and to monitor achievement of organizations' goals, objectives, and strategies. So there's five stages in establishing and maintaining organizational control applied all to operational segments. So number one is planning, so it's setting out your goals and objectives. Number two is executing, executing, sorry, which is led by senior management, which is the coordination, communication, implementation of strategy. Stage three is monitoring. So making sure that the current performance is measured against the standard or budget measures established in planning, Number four is evaluating. So, you know, looking at actual versus budget and interpreting and evaluating that. And then five is correcting. So taking corrective actions to ensure any circumstances that have led to failure of objectives. For example, you know, we may have thought that our product line is declining. So let's invest in a new product line. So we've spent all this money with the assumption that our new product line is going to grow 10% year on year annualized. Now, a year later, we look at the actual, we look at the budget and we find out that the actual revenue is much lower than the forecast revenue. So our return on our investment in this new product line is much lower. So what we'll do is we'll look at the controls that resulted in this. And after, because we've made this evaluation that we haven't met our targets and we'll find out that the management was incentivized um, to keep costs based off their P&L. Um, and this helped influence the decision and then corrective actions were taken by um, changing the terms of the bonus so that this wouldn't happen again. So there's some ways that we can help increase the level of control in a business around these investment decisions and strategic decisions. So number one is responsibility center. So this is a business unit or a division in an organization um, and this division is responsible for the activities and results of the organization. An organizational unit can be considered a responsibility and it has its own objectives that guides its activities and a manager that has been delegated authority and autonomy to make decisions on the resources required to achieve the unit's objectives. So there's a number of ethical issues um, around this and behaving in an ethical way is interpretive okay so it's not a, it's not one clear rule and what ethics are and what is the right thing is to do it can be interpreted in different ways by different people which makes it difficult to manage um, however the consequences of unethical behavior and the resulting decisions may directly affect the success failure reputation of an organization so it's very important that organizations manage this um, and that there are protocols put in place to prevent this. So there is actually an ethical uh, standards board, um, which the accounting profession is regulated by. Um, and this does come up in exams, so it's important to be across, you know, um, these boards and some of the frameworks within this, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and obviously we understand the consequences of unethical behavior, so loss of confidence by, you know, management employees or investors, um, declining company value. So for example, the Australian Wheat Board declined their share price materially after it was made public that it had been making payments to the Iraqi government to facilitate the sale of Australian wheats despite UN sanctions. Um, and then finally, company failure. So unethical practices may lead to the downfall of the business, such as Lehman Brothers during the GFC, or the downfall of a government even, such as in Iceland during the GFC. So these are the key five fundamental principles, and I recommend that you do learn these uh, because they do come up in exam questions. So number one is integrity. So understand the difference between each of them uh, and remember what they are. So number one is integrity, so to be straightforward and honest in all professional and business relationships. Number two is objectivity, so do not allow bias, conflict of interest, or undue influence of others to override professional or business judgments. So, you know, you might have, you know, a share scheme, um, and you want the value of those shares to increase, um, and that may influence your decision-making in the business, which may put the business at more risk, for example, investing in a risky investment, because you think that your share value might go up. 
Um, professional competence and due care. So make sure that you have enough professional knowledge and skill. Um, if you're the CFO, you know, make sure you've got all the required accounting degrees. Make sure you keep your knowledge up to date. Make sure that you are um, aware of new developments in law and practice and legislation techniques and act diligently. Um, confidentiality. So to respect the confidentiality of information. So if you're working on a transaction and you're working with sensitive information, make sure you keep that to yourself. Don't share that with anyone unless there's a legal right to do that. And finally, professional behaviours. To comply with relevant laws and regulations and avoid any action that discredits the profession. So don't break any laws, basically. Don't do anything illegal um, and so forth. So that is the end of the chapter one for management accounting. Very long. Um, and, you know... Um, Let's um let's 